Welcome to the CEC Report. It's 14th of September. I'm Robert Barwick and I'm joined by CEC Leader Craig Isherwood. Welcome Craig. Yeah, thanks Robbie. In this week's CEC Report, the Australian Government prepares for a major banking crash. Killing people won't solve Queensland's financial crisis. And finally, Libya, Egypt turmoil signals imminent World War III. So first, the Australian Government prepares for a major banking crash. A few months ago, the CEC in started mobilising here in Australia, Craig, the, we mobilised the population and political leaders around what must be done at um, zero hour of a major financial crisis, which we know is coming. And as part of that mobilisation, we spoke to regulators and um, people in, prop in the positions that are relevant here to see what contingency plans they had for a full banking collapse. Now, you're the one who made those calls. What did they have? Well, Robbie, at that particular time, it was really hard to find out what they had. Now, this is not advertised, and this idea is not advertised in the uh, in the press. But you know, I had the specific idea of, well, what exactly would happen if someone went to an ATM one day, and then no money came out. I mean, apart from the panic that would ensue because people would say, well, what's going on here? Uh, you know, didn't have access to their money. I thought, well, I better find out. So I started looking around. I rang one organisation which was called Emergency Management Australia. Now, this is a federal government organisation that's coordinated amongst the states at ministerial level, but it only deals with physical emergencies where, say, a state can't handle the emergency by themselves. And I think, you know, the Queensland floods was such a, as an example of that where there was such a huge catastrophe that the federal government had to step in with some of its resources. So it's a body that deals with physical uh, problems like Cyclone Tracy in, in the Northern Territory. But not the physical effects of a financial crisis. No, and that was a surprising thing. However, I spoke to some very uh, very helpful people there and they said, look, you really need to talk to someone in Treasury. So they gave me the, the, the name of a, a principal advisor, a serious senior person in the uh, Treasury, and I asked him this question about what would happen in the case of a, uh, a major bank falling over and he said well basically the, the Reserve Bank will step in and he basically uh, tried to allay my fears that there was mechanisms in place uh, to deal with this but he wasn't very much forthcoming he said there was this thing called the Council of Financial Regulators which actually there is and then this is made up of a grouping of the Treasury the Australian Produ Produ Prudential Re uh, Regulatory Authority oh, APRA, APRA. Uh, ASIC and, uh, and, and the Treasury um, so you have those four entities grouped together as a council of financial regulators. Now, Craig, um, I remember from the time that the, the key thing was whatever thinking they'd done was all based on after the fact. Yes. So that they had certain things that they could do after a crash had happened, right? But they, w they had no real contingency in preparation, preparation well, for that. That was my sense from, from the speaking to the guy in Treasury. He basically said, look, the R RBA would step in. But that's as far as it would go, and he was rather quick to get off the call. They don't want to discuss this, because my sense is that the global financial crisis, Robbie, really caught these guys by surprise. Mm. And, we, and we're going to have some we'll, footage we'll talk about that in a minute, yeah. Well, lo and behold, this week, just in the last 48 hours or so, the federal government has announced sweeping new powers for the bank regulator, APRA, the Australian Prudential Regulatory Authority, to be able to step in and take control of banks, insurers and super funds in the event of a crisis. So Craig, what are the powers well, they've got? What the report basically stated, Robbie, is that there is a risk that APRA's existing powers may not be sufficient to enable it to intervene efficiently in, event, in the event of a crisis in, the fi in a financial group, particularly where a company in a group is in receivership or liquidation or where a risk of that occurring exists. So they've identified the fact that most of our APRA's powers are after the fact. Mm. So what they're proposing is that uh, more authority be given to appoint statutory managers to a failing institution, that ex an extension of powers to wind up trouble financial groups, greater regulatory oversight of foreign banks in Australia, including preventing them from siphoning assets out of the country. That's a big one given the number of foreign banks that are coming into our country. More power to direct financial institutions to act in crisis situations and new authority to take preemptive action against super funds, including the removal of an individual trustee, directors or officers. This is interesting, Robbie, because we have $1.4 trillion tied up in superannuation funds. Now, 
What does that mean in, real, in the real economy? Well, Australia's entire gross domestic product is 1.3 trillion. The value of every single share on the share market is 1.3 trillion. But what's even more uh, frightening, Robbie, is that when I started making these calls, I discovered that there was a, um, uh, a big uh, elephant under the carpet. Now, on this program before, We've talked about the banks in Australia having a shareholding of about you know fourteen point one trillion dollars in derivatives yeah. over the counts of derivatives. In fact, that's gone up in the recent period. Seventeen now. It's now seventeen. What I didn't know that the entire turnover of the Australian financial system was one hundred and twenty eight trillion dollars, of which about ninety to ninety five percent is pure speculation over the counter derivatives trading, some regular de regulated derivatives trading. So you have this huge financial bubble, in a sense, of speculation inside Australia, and we regularly talk about the fact that the global system has a $1.4 quadrillion debt bubble, which is, of course, destroying and drowning the uh, European mm. Union nations and so forth at the present time. So I can see why our regulators would be getting a bit of a panic. Well, and the panic is the key thing because those figures you've just go, gone through prove why we've always warned about this is going to happen. But up until a few months ago, as your own calls proved, no one was really taking that into account. Now, it seems like th these APRA powers have been announced quite suddenly. And one of the bits of evidence of that is that the Australian Bankers Association appears to have been caught on the hop. So in the financial review um, of the 13th of September, when these were announced in the paper, the um, ABA, Australian Bankers Association Policy Director Tony Burke said, quote, it is important to note that the Australian banking sector remained profitable, stable and reliable throughout the GFC, unlike the experience of some foreign banks which required taxpayer bailouts. Mm -hmm. And he's saying that because he's saying, we, you know, we don't know much about this here, we'll look at the details, but it's important to know we're, we're fine. However, Craig, as this forum and our website full of press releases have screamed for four years, that's far from the truth. In October 12, 2008, the major banks went to Howard and said, if you don't give us, went to Rudd, sorry, and said, if you don't give us banking guarantees on what we owe overseas, we will be insolvent sooner rather than later. And there was a state of panic over that. Um, and the worst case was Macquarie Bank, which um, freedom of information investigations by the Age newspaper have subsequently revealed the level of panic in Macquarie Bank that that weekend they were emailing and phoning every political contact they had in Canberra to say we need a guarantee and we need it fast, right? And they eventually got a guarantee for $20 billion that, that um, they owed. Um, and so that's not a stable Australian banking system at all. Now, um, but here we have a an action by APRA, which, yes, to a lot of people will come out of the blue, but it, it confirms what we've always thought. I want to, I've got a, a question for you in a minute, but I, I just want to put it in the context of two events that are happening right now. One is they've made this announcement as China is grinding to a halt, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and we talked about that here a few weeks ago. The implications for that on Australia are massive. And they've also made an announce, this announcement just as in the U European Union, the German Constitutional Court has ruled in favour, effectively, of the bailout policy there, which will lead to more hyperinflation. And then overnight, um, our time, as we're uh, talking today, so the, the um, 14th of September, Ben Bernanke announced that it's definitely on quantitative easing three from the US Federal Reserve, where they're going to pump um, $80 billion or so a month into the economy, which is basically, which is literally printing money. That's what they're going to be doing. Mm. Well, when I say, sorry, literally, pr figuratively, literally printing money because they do it electronically. Um, so this announcement from APRA coincides with those big panic-based events. And my question for you, though, is um, given that the APRA's things come out of the blue, do you think your inquiries to them is what lit a fire under their tails. I think, Robbie, the problem with the financial system is that they believe their own propaganda up until the global financial crisis. And there's a very famous statement by Julia Gillard. And I want to play people just the beginning of our Homeowners and Bank Protection DVD right now. And I'll come back to it and make a few comments. Um, no one 12 months ago was talking about a global financial crisis. Now everybody is talking about a global financial crisis. 
How do you cover an economic crisis as deep and confusing as... And nobody seems to know what's going on in the world. Nobody seems to know. Uh, nobody has a crystal ball. And if there have been any lessons learned, Mr Speaker, over the last 30 years in Australia, it is the government should not be involved in banking. Australia is currently enjoying the strongest global economy in over 30 years and a massive mining boom which is filling the government's coffers. An unprecedented $42 billion nation building and jobs plan to support jobs and to invest in Australia's long term economic future. No one 12 months ago was talking about a global financial crisis. On the 25th of July, 2007, I warned that we were at the beginning of a countdown for a collapse of the world monetary financial system. This occurs at a time where the world monetary financial system is actually now currently in the process of disintegrating. Nothing mysterious about this. I've talked about it for some time. It's been in progress. It's not abating. What's listed as stock values and market values in the financial markets internationally is bunk. These are purely fictitious beliefs. There's no truth to it. The fakery is enormous. There is no possibility of a non-collapse of the present financial system. None. It's finished now. The present financial system cannot continue to exist under any circumstances, under any presidency, under any leadership, or any leadership of nations. Only a fundamental and sudden change in the world monetary financial system will prevent a general, immediate, chain reaction type of collapse. At what speed, we don't know, but it will go on and it will be unstoppable. And the longer it goes on, before being coming to an end, the worst things will get. And just a week after that, Bear Stearns bit the dust in America. Yeah, and the importance of that video, Robbie, is that we mobilised on Mr. LaRouche's warning. You know, mm. not just then, but years before, we had new citizens pumped out all over this country, millions of them forecasting this particular collapse of which he, on the 25th of July 2007, really crystallised, such that Bear Stearns collapsed shortly after. So we knew what was going on, but it seems to me from these calls that the financial people did not believe it. Wayne Swan didn't believe it, Joe Hockey didn't believe it, in fact he put it in writing, and also Julia Gillard. It's reassuring that they're in charge. Then. Oh, well that's the problem. The only solution is a return to Glass-Steagall and to policies of banking regulation, which we've talked about quite often on this program. There's a lot more on our website on this, Robbie, and I think that we need to leave it there because... We're, I mean, we're, running, we're running out of time, but... Yes, just to reiterate the point, for APRA to do this, um, there's panic afoot, but it's well-founded panic. All right, when we come back, we're going to talk about how killing people will not solve Queensland's financial crisis. Welcome back to the CEC Report. Killing people won't solve Queensland's financial crisis. This week, Craig, Jan Pakolis, our yeah. Queensland State Secretary of the CEC, she challenged the new Premier of Queensland, Campbell Newman, that who is acknowledging Queensland is in a deep economic crisis. In fact, he calls Queensland a Spain of Australia, and I think he's being sincere about that. Um, but she's challenged him to learn from Argentina's example of how to deal with the financial crisis without killing people. Um, ominously, what he's doing is copying, he's compared Queen Anne's land to Spain, but he's copying Spain because he's replicating the kind of um, deep cuts to health care that have, that are um, on, on under, being undergone in Spain right now in order to, to um, free up the money for Queenslanders to pay their debts. So what's the Argentine experience? Now I'll just summarise this quickly. In 2001, the Argentine government was one of these right-wing um, uh, Banker buddies government, bankers buddy governments, right? And their finance minister was a, was a joker named Domingo Cavallo, and he was a darling of the Mont Pelerin Society and these kind of um, institutions. And there was a debt crisis 
under his watch. And what he did to deal with that debt crisis is he did everything that the bankers demanded and put the people through pain, including corralling, he used the term corralling, people's deposits in banks so they couldn't pull them out in a panic, right? So the, the, the banks stayed afloat. Anyway, the people reacted to that, justifiably so. And the government that replaced him was the government of Nesta Kirchner. And this Nesta Kirchner took an entirely different approach. He made a speech to the UN in 2003 where he said, the dead can't pay their debts. We will not put the people through pain to prop up the banks. He, um, he put the foreign bondholders, whom Argentina owed their, their foreign debt to, he put them on notice that you're the ones that are going to take a haircut here. And he forced them to renegotiate their debt. And most of those bondholders were in Italy. And it was a big scandal at the time because here was a country standing up to the bondholders, similarly to the way Jack Lang had done in, in New South Wales in 1932. But it went, th it went through. But Argentina became this pariah state as of then. However, inside Argentina, it's worked. Nesta Kirchner has died, but his wife took over, Cristina Kirchner Fernandez. Um, she's now the president of Argentina. She's kept this approach. Argentina has invested in infrastructure. Um, it's invested in scientific research, and it's invested in domestic industries. Right, And it's got to the point where last month, the Argentine government repaid the final instalment to the depositors whose money was frozen back in 2001, because they're always committed to repaying that. Right? Mm -hmm. And when they did it, the finance minister, the, the current finance minister of Argentina, made the point that people do not have to die to solve a financial crisis. And it's, a, it's an excellent example, um, which is why we're raising it here. Um, so this is a clear example of something that works. However, Campbell Newman's not doing that. And you've got evidence to show that it looks like what he is doing is copying the example of Jeff Cannett here in Victoria in 1992. Yeah, Robbie, we put our pamphlet in uh, 1998 called Australia's Healthcare Reforms and Nuremberg Crime, a Nuremberg Crime Against Humanity. This details the standard with which you know, the Nazis were actually tried and the number of them were hung. The point is, though, the advisor to Campbell Newman was Peter Costello, right? And the point is that in his first budget, slash $3.7 billion from the healthcare budget. In his second budget, he slashed another $1 billion. Peter Costello is a darling of the H.R. Nichols Society, which is a part of the fronts for the, what we call the Montpellier Society, an organisation that promotes the slashing of healthcare and the privatisation of healthcare full stop. So you had this massive reduction in healthcare as far as the federal government is concerned. Along with that, you had the Jeff Kennett uh, um, cuts, cuts and you know, so-called reforms. In the first, from 1992 to 1995, Jeff Kennett slashed 40,000 people from the healthcare sector, including cleaners, you know, caterers, uh, frontline staff, nurses, so on and so forth. And the point is that here you have a li two liberal uh, members of parliament, two, two uh, leaders, cutting the budget. This is a Montpellier society policy, and it's not unlawful that given that uh, Peter Costello was the advisor to Campbell Newman, the first thing he does do is come out and cut health. This will have a direct response in killing people because you're taking away the ability of supplying needed medical care to the population. And at the end of the day, Craig, they're doing it to meet the requirements for a credit rating, which AAA is, credit rating, which is which is arbitrary anyway. And they just lost it down to AA anyway. Yeah. So there's a lot of things, uh, Robbie, in terms of how you can solve this, like, for example, creating a state bank, which we put out in the press release, and people should get our press releases and on a regular basis, and that will help them to understand what the solutions are. Because this is going to be what's happening in Queensland, you can expect to see happen more around Australia like it's happening around the world and it's you can't, there's no justification for killing people. All right, but we're running out of time again. When we come back, we're going to talk about the war danger that's just heated up in this, this week. Welcome back to the CEC report. Finally, Libya, Egypt, turmoil signals world war is imminent. So if you've been following the news, tensions are rising fast in the Middle East. Um, just to set the stage a little bit, a couple of weeks ago, Barack Obama and David Cameron both seized on reports of chemical weapons in Syria to um, flag that that would be their excuse for an attack, i.e. weapons of mass destruction. And the reports are almost definitely as, as baseless as they were for Iraq. Um, 
The September 11 anniversary was this week, the 11th anniversary of September 11, and that saw the US Embassy in Egypt storm by um, Muslim protesters, and then you had this much worse attack on the um, US Embassy in Libya, which um, by protesters who killed the US Ambassador to Libya. By the way, an embassy that was defenceless. There was no, despite the, the alert, there was no um, Marines to defend it, and that is extremely curious as well. Um, in the ambassador's case, it has to be said, though, that this is the man who went into Libya while Gaddafi was still president to cultivate these same rebel groups against Gaddafi, mm. and now they've turned on him. And that's just, this is American foreign policy coming back to bite it. Um, uh, similarly this week, the rebels in Syria this time, it couldn't be disguised, they've been caught out at another massacre, Craig, and this, it's so bad it's prompted warnings from the UN that they face war crimes charges. Um, but in both Libya and, and Syria, these are the groups that our side, the West, climbed into bed with to achieve this r agenda of regime change. And on top of all this though, this is, a, this is atmosphere for what's happening out of Israel, where Netanyahu is going nuts. And if our friends at the Australia-Israel Jewish Affairs Committee who tell us they, they watch our show are watching, yes, he's going nuts. And we're going to tell everyone he's going nuts. Um, and well, he is so desperate to get his attack on Iran going. He's been attacking the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in the United States, General Martin Dempsey, for his efforts to try and avoid war at all costs. Which we already would have had, Robbie, had he not been leading exactly. this resistance. Dempsey has been the, um, the obstacle so far. Netanyahu is now demanding a meeting with Obama in October, but there's possibly a charade going on here because Obama, there's a scandal because Obama said he won't meet with him because the election's on, etc. And that's been seen as, as um, uh, a, a source of uh, controversy between the two of them. However, as we reported on this program quite a few months ago, a source already informed us that Obama has underhandedly given Netanyahu the go-ahead on the grounds that he, d he, he seemingly does it unilaterally so that America can't be seen to be part of the decision, but of course, America will always come in behind and back up um, Israel for the consequences. So, Craig, this, is, this period is the lead up to the US election that we're in right now. How dangerous is it because of that? Well, Robbie, what's dangerous is what Mr. LaRouche elaborated this week, in fact, in that there can't be any forecasts or predictions about what's going to happen because there's so many variables. The only thing you can forecast is it's unforecastable. Because, look, you, we weren't expecting what was happening in, uh, with the yeah. case of Libya. Mm. Look, you didn't know what was going to take place with the Constitutional Court in, in, in Europe. This has now led to new hyperinflation tensions. The place, everything is going out of control and becoming very unstable. And again, look, the only solutions to these problems is for the reintroduction of policies like Glass-Steagall through the US uh, uh, system to start with, which means the elimination get, in the sense of not having Obama in a position of power. And through Glass-Steagall, it, it, it allows a commitment to econ the kind of economic development that can supersede all these tensions. Yeah, and I think the point is there's a lot of solutions to what are seemingly intractable problems, but you have to dump the whole idea of globalisation, of the policies of British trade globalisation, and go back to the principles of what we call the Treaty of Westphalia and sovereign nation states. Respecting national sovereignty. Yeah, and that's what Putin represents, and any attacks on Syria are seen as a provocation for Russia, and that will draw Putin into thermonuclear war. Yep. All right, we've run out of time. This has been a densely packed CEC report, so thanks for watching, and tune in next week for more of the CEC report. Mm -hmm.